Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. We get to talk with uh, the founders and thinkers and strategists that are building the new version of the world that we will eventually participate in. Uh, we're super excited to uh, to talk to this guest today about um, kind of a, a, some, something called decentralized knowledge, which just to me sounds super fascinating. Uh, Mark, how are things in your world, man? <laughs> Very often my knowledge feels like it's a bit decentralized um, <laughs> from my brain. Um, I'm doing great. It's had some great feedback on Thinking on Paper this week. So uh, Robin Bennett, if you're listening, thank you for your awesome feedback saying that she thinking on paper was helping her to acclimatize to web3 chain so that's kind of what we're trying to do so awesome news and yeah very lo looking forward to kind of building on that with today's show and i think this is one of those conversations new decentralized news fake news deep fakes where it's important this is world changing potentially isn't it so looking forward to getting into it well, the, the whole thing, the, there's a there's a common thread between all of these discussions that we have is is trust, right? And how do you yeah. trust uh, the sources that you lean on for information, right? And, yeah. you know, the, the human brain loves shortcuts, right? And we like to build those trust paths, you know, quickly. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, and it's hard to change them once we've picked them, right? Yeah. Um, so let's, let's jump right in. Uh, definitely want to thank our amazing sponsors, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E. They are marketing's on-demand talent platform. So if you've got a project that needs some creative energy, some some building energy uh, to point towards, whether it's a week long or a year long, they are great at building interdisciplinary teams, managing those teams through the process. Uh, over 3,000 vetted solopreneurs um, with different specialties that uh, they're able to coordinate in real time. So they're amazing. Check them out if you need help. We all need help. W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Mark, let's intro our guest and dive headfirst into this topic. I will. Uh, just to add to the sponsor, we're looking for sponsor for season three. By the way, if you want to get involved with thinking on paper, contact us. Um, yeah, without further ado, our guest today is Kieron Murray, founder um, and CEO of Olas Protocol. He's a seasoned veteran of the blockchain space, been in Web3 well, for a long time, and looking forward to seeing how he is going to instill trust back into our media landscape, our increasingly fractured media landscape as well. So welcome to the show, Kieron. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Wonderful, man. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. Look forward to diving in. Uh, let's let's start with our carryover question. We always like to thread the discussion, the conversation between these episodes. And um, from our last episode, um, Mercina left us a question of what is your take on how emerging technologies work or don't work together and what could they achieve when they do? So like the intersection, the confluence of all of these technologies, what are the most interesting to you? And what do you, what do you think are the ones that are most promising? Um, okay. Um, I guess like a lot of these things are in, built or invented for one reason. Um, but when you stitch them together, they can actually create something new. And that's one of the interesting things about Bitcoin. Satoshi didn't actually invent anything new. Proof of work was invented as an anti-spam email mechanism. Now we ended up settling on spam folders instead and uh, you know people filtering those those messages into where we didn't want them. Um, but that was built for one thing. Uh, there was all other aspects of Bitcoin that were built for various things. There was nothing to do with money and Satoshi just happened to be abreast all of these technologies and put them together to create something new without actually inventing something himself, which is very interesting. And weirdly enough at Olus, we're pretty much doing the same thing. I'd say 90% of the stuff we're using is other people's inventions. We, we've, we've come up with a few novel things ourselves, but most of our work was actually just having the vision to put these things together to solve a huge problem we saw. I didn't know that about, about which, yeah, which of those technologies that, well, yeah, I'm mirroring, I didn't know about the email thing, but which of the technologies that you're using, which already exists? Uh, decentralized identity for one, uh, blockchains for two, um, quadratic funding for three, um, prediction markets for four, except we've kind of tweaked them. They're the kind of novel parts of our, uh, system. Oracles would be another, um, pretty much everything we're using. 
as, as uh, other people's inventions. Well, you know what's wonderful about this is I've always had this kind of ringing theme in my head that you know creativity is the rearrangement of found elements in a unique way, right? You know, mm -hmm. and we can't always just poof have something net new. It's got to be this brilliant combination of things that were used for other things. So I, I, I think that's awesome. Can we? Yeah. Can you break down some of these components that you had talked about uh, mm -hmm. for, for our audience? Uh, quadratic funding, walk us through that really quick. Okay, uh, quadratic funding is a really interesting, I always find this hard to explain this one. Uh, it's a really <laughs> interesting, <laughs> it's a really interesting. It's the name, it's a scary name. I know, funding. it's just like everyone's like, what in the hell is that? It's actually a site called What the Fuck is Quadratic <laughs> Funding? which people is, visit that website maybe people yeah it's w2etf but um it's actually the best explanation of quadratic funding much better than i'm about to give um <laughs> it, it's um it's it best summed up i think as a crossroads between or a halfway point between markets and democracy so markets are essentially one dollar one vote the more money you have the more you can sway an outcome in your favor in markets um which tends to work really well for us. Markets are amazing, but the downside of that is they can be bought, they can be controlled with people with lots of money. Um, democracy is the other extreme. Uh, it's one person, one vote, no matter what resources or information they have, which also is great for you know preventing tyranny, etc. But the downsides of that is you have people who know a lot about a certain topic who only have the same voice as a bunch of people who know very little which is a bit shit. So quadratic funding tries to find a middle ground between these two where it's one, it's, it's a, you have to buy to get into the system, but every time you spend another dollar, it, it scales quadratically and not line, linearly. So every dollar you spend to influence that market actually gets more expensive to a point where you're, you're probably gonna reach where I'm not, I can't buy this market anymore. Um, so for funding purposes, for us, um, we, um, we have these competitions where, let's say, a writer wants to write on climate change. Uh, we'll have a quarterly funding competition. Um, they will canvas for funding from communities, and then their funding will be matched from a big funding pool that would have been funded by institutions, because we don't want the institutions uh, influencing the outcome. Um, and let's say person A gets a thousand and person B also gets a thousand, but person A gets it from 10 donors and person B only gets it from one, person A will get way, way more funds from the matching pool because their funds will be much more community-based, more democratic. So that's essentially how the, the explanation behind quadratic funding and how we're going to use it. So, okay. So just to, just to clarify, so say Mark and I are two writers on this platform. We want to write for climate change. The donors mm -hmm. that I've locked in are 10 individuals and Mark has one donor specifically. My, my donor pool, my, my, I guess my donor pool is more valuable because it's diversified and rather than coming from one person. One is, person. Exactly. Okay. Well, I don't know if this is an example or, or real life, because I would like to write about climate change and I'd like to be paid to do it so maybe I could apply for this pool um <laughs> listening to that I was thinking it could become a popularity contest because if you it's, if you're very popular and well known you can get 10 funders and if you're not you can't is that is yeah, that it, is there something in the system which prevents that or is that part of the system of there is that, that's an excellent uh observation and there is um so that's just the funding side of things um once you get your funds you can't just use them to write and take them home with you. Uh, another very kind of novel part of OLIS is that we have native decentralized review protocols built in. So these are essentially a replacement for editorial and peer review, uh, open ones, market-based. So to take you through the flow further, this uh, person A would have $1,000 or more, they would have got it matched, but they have money to write an OLIS and they stake $50 on an article. 20% of that tenor goes to uh, a bounty to fact checkers to find something wrong with that article. And if they find something wrong with it, a judging panel is formed um, of half the seats are formed by other writers who put down climate change as a topic of specialty. 
and the other half are open. And the rationale is here is to get expertise in, but also to guard against collusion and groupthink. So you have um, both disruptors and curious minds as fact checkers, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, and um, it, let's say the article is found to be bunk, found, found to be factually incorrect and just very bad. The, the writer will lose a stake first and foremost. And second of all, a uh, reputation score will be docked. So when they go to the next quarterly funding round, I'd like to think, I know some people can be loyal um, to a fault and, and just back people even though they're bad. I'd like to think that would greatly affect their performance in the funding markets next time, next time round. So that, to answer your question, it should there isn't an initial protection, but there should be one ongoing. Yeah, on, um, so if, as a, a writer's perspective, okay, I'm doing, I'm writing an article. I have done a pretty good job of researching my my facts, but there's like one or two. It, I mean, we probably should yep. get into how all this works. But is there? Do I have the opportunity then to take advice and change and update facts? Do, will the article stay long alive? Kind of it's, how long might this process take? It it stays live, and you'll only get your you can update and say, yeah, the fact committee or the judging panel found against me. And you know what? I hold my hands up. I'm actually going to change this. But that won't change your payout um, because there will be that initial two-week period. I'm thinking about two weeks for this, or the review process to play out, where people could have been misinformed. So there has to be accountability. But if, yeah. if the overall article was good and it was just uh, a few hiccups, shall we say, particularly if they weren't huge facts they weren't consequential to the whole gist of the piece um you'll still get 90 percent or something and you have to remember 90 percent of that stake it all goes to you uh, there's no rupert murdoch or bloomberg uh taking their cut and then if people liked it and they add tips on top of that which is going to be the main revenue source in my view um you'll still get 90 percent of those tips so th there's room for error but still accountability Okay. I, I love, I love, I love the, I love the concept of this. I love the idea of this. Um, the technology, how, how much of this process through technology is, is automated because certain writers who are not very tech aware would look at this and be like, Whoa, this is like massively complex as opposed to, Hey, you hire me to write something. I bang out some words. You yeah. send me a hundred bucks and we, we call it good. Yeah, um, I'm expecting the kind of interaction with this protocol to be very different to my explanation of it. I, I we're an app, uh, we're at the app layer of Web three, which is, you know, pretty much the last ten years, everyone's just been building infrastructure, 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 and I think we're at a point now where we can at least start planning apps and and start tentatively building them because the scaling is getting there, and all the other tooling and plugging into the financial system and people just getting used to Web3 is getting to a point where we can do that. Um, but obviously, we need to make these Web3 apps as intuitive and as user-friendly as Web2. So even though there's going to be complex blockchains underneath them and, and complex prediction markets uh, underneath uh, some of the markets, the user will literally just go, I raise money, I stake money, I have to get my facts right. Uh, the reader will go, I like that piece, I tipped it. And it, the tipping will be as easy as like liking on Twitter or Facebook now. You know, it's that would be that frictionless. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping and expecting it to be very user-friendly. So I, I think we've we've kind of hinted a picture of what OLAS is without mm -hmm. kind of actually yeah. defining what it is. Um, it, essentially, are we talking about the distribution of news and calls like, like and essentially getting that truth in in the news uh the higher level pitch for olus is it's a long form media publishing platform um for trustworthy information so the, its competitor in the legacy system would be any type of media that is reviewed so that would be news media that has editorial review um, some might think it doesn't, the amount of misinformation we see, but it does. And uh, academic media that is peer review. So right. we're directly challenging that type of media. Um, and we are reintroducing, or sorry, introducing a completely different funding model based on subsidies that is made possible by advancements in payment technologies. 
and we are introducing native review protocols that are open and market-based. Um, so the crowd, rather than committees that are quite opaque and possibly prone to back scratching and corruption, um, reviews information on the internet. The idea is that these review protocols will actually become native to the internet itself and part of its fabric. Um, and that's kind of the three main elements of, of Olus. Okay. Nice. I kind of think about this might be a this might be a silly comparison, but is it is I started thinking about like with the peer review with the review process. If I write something and then other community reviews it, Wikipedia is kind of a yeah. at least not not the financial transaction piece of it, but the the community review piece. Is that a relatable concept? Yeah, so I think Wikipedia would be an initial stepping stone to where we want to get to. Um, Wikipedia is still relatively closed in the sense that yes you can propose edits but i think it's quite hierarchical from what yeah. i remember there's not many people um, who actually do it either it, there's, yeah there's very yeah small there's, there's, you've kind of super uh, editors that have kind of closed the market basically um and also i think uh, culturally it's very much you know western and uh, are these people getting the information right about all the other parts of the world that they're not necessarily affiliated or affiliated have connected to and that's a big question um where this protocol um should um solve those problems i think there's a market of people for that love the fact checking element of stuff or love like reviewing something be like yo this isn't right and here's why and you know whatever whatever their incentive in in their mind is to do that there are people are you finding like it, it, as you kind of built this, are you finding that as well, that there's a large group of people that are interested in that? I'm, I, yeah, I, I'm one of those people, by the way. I'm a commenter on newspaper sections, but like as soon as you comment, it gets buried and thousands of comments. Um, it might be upvoted and you get to the top, but it might not. Or if you want to critique an article, you can post it on your own Twitter. But the long and the short of it is, most of the people who read that article will not see your criticism or your, insight or your you know fact checking um so we want to bring that ability to comment or to note something into the actual review process itself and then affect the content because most journalists they're not they, i'm sure they read the comment sections they do and they'll take things on board particularly if it's an intelligent comment but most of them aren't going to care too much about what's said they care about what uh their editorial review board says and most importantly what their owner who tends to have economic interests and, and ideologies himself and has set an editorial direction. Um, and that's the main thing they have to concern themselves with. On this system, you have to concern yourself with what the informed people, and that's crucially, not, it's, it's not just the members of the crowd, what are they gonna pull you up on? And you always have to challenge yourself and check yourself before you press publish on this protocol, because otherwise you won't get paid. Okay. Kind of makes sense. Um, I, I really like the idea. As someone who personally is getting to the stage where they don't trust anything they read or see, that, it, that maybe uh, no, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. Maybe this is something <laughs> which I would would I would really enjoy personally, just because trying to create, as Jeremy said at the beginning, things that you trust, it's, it's, and it's it's not getting any easier, is it? So <laughs> this would be no. a way. Well, no, that's the thing. Like, so if the internet democratized publishing, which it did, and you know, we're all journalists, if we want to be now citizens, jur citizen journalists or bloggers or, you know, social media posters, we can say anything we want on the internet now, but if that was bad enough for misinformation, because there's no controls, more voices is good, by the way, I'm not, I'm not you know, giving out about that. I, I like the fact that more people can say stuff, but we lost in that transition, we lost the review part. And this is what we're trying to bring back. But if that was bad enough, like AI is now like, I don't know, supercharging that by like, it's just because it's so trivially easy to create content with AI and we're going to be awash with information with the tools, you know, devoid of the tools to judge if it's accurate or not. Um, so I think there's a huge societal need for something we're doing. Um, and, is and there a thing in your successful. protocol about about AI created content. Do you have any kind of, is there any philosophy behind um, 
you can't use AI. Or if you use AI and our readers can obviously tell that it's been created with AI, then it, you you are penalized. Or is there anything that's built into the system or do you, or in two years it won't matter because you won't be able to tell the difference thinking about that? No, it's just accuracy. So if you write a piece using Claude or ChatGPT or whatever, and it's factually accurate, you're going to get paid. Um, okay. we're, we're just concerned with accuracy and truth. Um, yeah. How you get there is your business. Um, what I will say is you won't be able to set up multiple accounts and then just churn out thousands of articles a week to get paid um, because that's, you know, I, I, you, even, even if using AI, I want a lot of thought to have gone into it. I want to um, make sure the market doesn't get too bulged and everyone can have a, have a slice of the pie. So we, that's where the decentralized uh, identity technologies come in. Um, anti sybil attacks to explain to your user is basically someone setting up multiple accounts or setting up accounts with bots. Um, that will all be prevented by these protocols. So you'll only how? Have, uh, how? You like, as a to... seasoned airdrop farmer, I'm quite. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the, the sybil farming is quite a. Yes. Um, uh, a relevant topic for me and for crypto in general at the moment. And like, what are you doing? Yeah, to it's, it's a huge thing. In fact, I think airdrops are just not viable anymore because of it. Um, but uh, what we're using is um, proof of unique human protocol. So every a period of time, it'll probably be something like every two weeks, you will have to jump on either a people party or scan a biometric um, world coins, the biometric approach, bright ideas, a people party, you basically hop on a call like we're on now, wave to everyone, go, Hey, I'm a human. And, <laughs> uh, they, I love they also, that. yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And then they, they also have, uh, a way, uh, of knowing if you set up multiple accounts. So there is, uh, so you, you can't be a bot and you can only have one account and you'll, and you're, be and a you're using world coin for the, 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 orb, might, the eye orb. We'll, we'll probably use multiple um, because it just makes it easier for the users. Um, but I'm sure Wellcoin will probably be one of them. Yeah. The digital Id identity thing is such a big part of this. And, you know, I, I got on the digital identity train like years ago when the idea of open mustard seed came out of MIT and it was all <laughs> database driven. Mark's like, he's talking about open mustard seed again. <laughs> like, stop. But no, I, I remember oh, no, I've been waiting for a guest to go, yes, open mustard seed. And then for I am um, totally lost. So I'm not, I'm not that guest. <laughs> it, it was it, it it just it just got my brain churning even before i knew about blockchain and then now blockchain is a way to decentralize this what they used to call personal data stores right and and verifiable identities and different identities right so i i can have i can have me but then i have work me and i have lacrosse coach me and i have writer exactly. me and i have uh is is that is that allowed on your on your platform because that would be a segmentation of identity right yeah no you, you've, you've touched on something that um, I think is another powerful use of OLIS, and that is people ha who have an insight and want to write about it, but they know this insight might be unpopular. Right now, the cost to one's career from the mob are just too great to risk that. Where on OLIS, you can go, you know what, I'm just going to write this under a pseudonym, but I get to carry over all my performance under my other identity. I won't call it my real identity, but my my given name identity, but I write this under a pseudonym, anonymous essentially. Um, and yes, a lot of people might kick off, but my payout and reputation score is dependent on the market, not the mob. Um, awesome. And so it, it frees up people to write, you know, so say something they feel is valuable, but I would otherwise be too scared to, to say it. So that's um, cancel culture and whistleblowers. Exactly. No more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of things that need to be said about certain, I, we talked about this in the, in the pregame, but like, you know, Mark and I've used this nomenclature a lot, the calcified systems, right? So if you speak up against these systems and these processes and these ways of doing things, you can severely limit your, your participation in those because those are the systems, right? Those are the systems that are happening, but mm -hmm. to be able to exit the system and uh, talk about it in a meaningful way without you know, without negative financial rep, uh, yes. repercussion. That's super interesting. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's, you know, people, one of the downsides of the internet is people 
our, our go with our gut initial angry reaction. And that's the thing that often like, you know, someone angrily retweets something and somebody else just does it. And in seconds, this anger has just gone around the world, exploded. And, and you, eventually people probably calm down and get to the truth, but not, not before someone's career is in the gutter. Um, so, you know, if we can build systems that can guard against our worst instincts, like that, our initial emotional reactions, I think we'll be all the better for it. Yeah. I think the whole awareness of, of our default mode. So, you know, uh, Kieran, we've got a book club. Um, this is a shameless plug for a book club, but we read, uh, Shane Parrish's book, um, that, that was really amazing. That talked about these default mechanics that, um, you know, everybody has, they're biologically ingrained in who we are as, as humans, but to be aware of those, uh, is, is super, super important and critical. Um, yeah. Cause that bad energy reverberates big time. Um, yeah. so, so let's talk about, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's, let's talk about, um, okay. So we get, we get this, we get this put together, right? Olas is a, is a platform, right? Where, where this mm -hmm. news resides, right? So I love the idea of pushing up against these systems that are out there. Right. But they, what are some of the barriers? What are some of the biggest challenges that you see in, in letting this wonderfully brilliant plane take off and start flying? Um, I, I think the, the big unknown, um, is the revenue model. Um, if subsidies were viable for media now, they'd probably use it. Uh, I know Wikimedia does, they take in about $200 million a year, I think at the moment, but Wikimedia is really cornered or Wikipedia. It's, you know, <laughs> child has cornered that market. So they have such traffic, even of a tiny, tiny proportion of that traffic just gives $15 a year or whatever, they're taking in huge amounts. In news media, The Guardian does okay, but it also needs um, rich philanthropists to prop it up. So there's no example in history where a media industry has sustained itself by people's voluntary donations. And our big bet is that because without a paywall, um, so lots of eyes on every article, and also by reducing friction. So if I want to tip the, or sorry, if I want to donate to The Guardian now, they'll recommend 10, 15, 20, $30 because it's, they know you're not going to do it every time you read the paper. So they want you to do it like annually or monthly or something. Um, you have to whip out your credit card. You have to do lots of things that would stop people from actually, even though they might go, I'd, I'd actually like to, to pay them. They won't. Our big hope is that when people get to the end of an individual article, instead of having been asked to pay for a bundle of articles, many of them they don't want, they will just go, you know what? That was actually a good read. I'll tip that 50 cents. And they don't have to take out a credit card. It's just, as I said, it's the, as easy as liking a post on Facebook because that's the way payments are going in Web3. Um, and so that's, that's our big unknown. I, I'd say that's the big risk to our success. We'll have three years where uh, tokenized, token issuance will subsidize uh, journalism and academic research. After that, the training wheels will be taken off and we're hoping that people will donate and, and tip. It's really good because I, I'm sure everyone has their favorite journalists or their favorite articles. They go to different websites, different news outlets, and there might be, you know, like a sports journalist or, or somebody who's writing about yeah. culture and you don't, you don't want to pay 30, but okay, you read a good article. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll tip that. And if it's easy yeah. and simple and the click of a button, then you would, you would do it. A lot of people would do it. Anyway, what, what's, um, what can I tip with? Well, the, 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 the bet, again, the bet is on web three technology. So you, you will, whatever's in your crypto wallet. Any, any, anything I, I want. I, okay. Yeah. Like, well, whatever, sorry, whatever the journalist accepts. So I'd say the most common currency will be your national currency, your fiat currency, whatever country you live in. Um, and the most common currency by far will be the dollar because you know, the dollar is the dollar and everyone runs the dollar when they're, when they want money. Um, it, it's the safest currency around. Um, but we will also have a native stable coin and some people might want to take equity. So they'll, they'll take maybe 30% of their tips in Olus and hoping they'll take a bet on the success of this thing themselves or, or, or possibly ETH or whatever other cryptocurrency there is out there. Um, but it will be, it'll be down to journalists. So if, um, if Mark and I as a writer or, you know, my neighbor, my neighbor, Steve, 
as a as a brilliant fact checker like how could we get involved with this like today are you are you guys up and running where are you guys at like okay uh, what's no, the roadmap no. look like how are you yeah yeah sure uh we are very early doors so we spent a year the, the systems that underpin this are extremely complex particularly the markets so we spent a year designing those uh we've just gone public with them about two uh months ago i'm now in the process of kind of growth hence why i'm doing calls like this um and hiring out the team and we're going to start building very shortly i would expect a build time of minimum a year and probably approaching two years so we're we're quite a bit away but in, in many ways that suits us because blockchain is still you know developing i don't think the throughput scalability will be there for us in six months so it's good to like plan for a little bit further out also, you know, usage of wallets, um, et cetera, is still just growing. And then mo most importantly of all, we need journalists. So we need to get buy-in before we even launch this thing. So we're, we're take, taking an unusual step. We're like doing a conference before we even launch, um, which is quite an odd thing for a Web3 protocol to do. But we, we really need to build awareness and get buy-in to this idea from the start. And I guess educate potential early adopters about you know, the financial benefits here, as I mentioned, the first three years will be funded by token issuance. Um, and how I sell this to people is that imagine the first three years of Uber's existence, that the drivers got paid in Uber equity rather than currency, or at least partially paid in it. A lot of those drivers would be very rich today. Um, so there's a, there's a financial incentive and an, a freedom incentive for journalists. Do you, do you want to work for yourself now? Do you want to free yourself from the strictures of um, an editorial direction or topics you might not, you're, you're told to write on that you might actually not know about what they, the newspaper needs to get it out? Um, there's, there's numerous advantages for journalists. You mentioned the word conference. If there's anything thinking on paper can do, we'd like, that sounds like something we'd like to be involved in, Jeremy. Nespa. Um, okay. For another call. Uh, you've yeah. mentioned markets and I, I'm sure I read about prediction markets and I know that there's a big hoopla about poly market, whatever it's called at the moment. Yeah. What role is the prediction playing in what you're building with Olas, if at all? Okay, so, yeah. So I suppose a prediction market can be a misleading term. Um, it's essentially, a prediction market's just a market. Um, it's people, if you want to have a voice in the outcome uh, you have to put money on the line. That's essentially what a prediction market is. Uh, the most successful prediction markets in the world are the financial markets. I think I call a stock market as a prediction market for the future value of a stock. A bond market's a prediction market for the future uh, economic output of a country. Um, uh, yada, yada, yada. The, okay, outside so. Of, yeah, so outside of those, sports betting is the main use case for prediction markets. They haven't really taken off for other things, although poly, poly market's doing quite okay, but it's still mainly the same things people always bet on, sports, politics, yeah. um, stuff like that. And the reason for that is sports and politics, uh, they kind of transcend markets in the sense of the, the passion people have for their sports teams or their political parties often causes them to make bets they probably shouldn't, <laughs> which... Um, you know, is a subsidy to the kind of shrewder market participants who get to bet against them. And that's why those markets flourish. Um, whereas that doesn't really exist for other things. Um, so you kind of have to subsidize them. And the way we're going to do it is that, um, as I said, with the journalist, when he raises or she raises money, um, it's not just for themselves. It's for their reviewers, for their fact checkers, for their judges. Um, they get paid out of that pot as well. So they get subsidized to sit on a panel and basically say, that's true, that's false, that's true. They, 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 they adjudicate between the fact checkers and the journalists who are, uh, the journalists essentially the defense, the fact checkers, the prosecution, the panel will come to a conclusion on the merits of either case and payouts will be determined by, by that conclusion. And the judges also, uh, their payouts are determined how close they are to the median judge. So if you're a judge that's consistently getting things wrong too, um, you're not going to get paid. And in fact, your re reputation score will go so low, you will cease to have the ability to be a judge because 
judging is the most important part of the system. Well, second most important, like the journalists are the most important part um, because they are the final say on whether that specific article is true or not. And you know, we're not naive enough to think that uh, the panels are gonna get everything right all the time. In fact, they'll get stuff wrong a lot of the time. The aim is not for perfection, that's just silly. The aim is to improve upon the current system by, by quite a bit. And if, if a panel gets it wrong, a journalist can always just go, you know what, I'll write another article and, and prove, prove them wrong. You, that, that's your get out clause, I guess. Okay. This is, man, what a, what a massive initiative uh, yeah. this is, Kiran. Like, this is massive. This is a massive initiative. So whenever I think of something that could be, you know, this big to kind of reinvent a way we do things, I always look for ways to like, how do you test it tangibly without the technology? So have you mocked any of these flows with like writers and groups of people? And like, have you done anything like that? I've, I, I haven't got full mock-ups, but yes, I've approached journalists and go, because the, the, the big thing is here, are you prepared to stake money on your writing? And immediately they go, what? No way. But when you explain to them that it's not the money. All moment, writers would say yes, wouldn't they? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Uh, when, when, when you explain to them it's not the mob when you explain to them if you are good at what you do and everyone likes to think they're good at what they do um and that uh the revenue model should bring in a lot more income and you don't have to share that income with a private owner because there's no owner of this protocol um yes it's that the the, the re responses have been overwhelmingly positive and then i guess i haven't really canvassed about fact checking or whatever because that's just the people you know, that's the people who already, as you mentioned, there are people who just comment on news sections. There are people who just spend their time on Reddit. Um, I'm very confident they exist and they would even, they would comment and fact check even if they didn't get paid and we're going to pay them. So. Well, I, it's almost, a, it's a, sorry to jump on it. It's almost like a knowledge <laughs> flex. Like people love to knowledge flex, right? Yeah, so exactly. if you could get paid for your yeah. knowledge flex, like that's, that's kind of. Yeah. I, I, and it's, it's the, Benefits go on and on, by the way. If you're a very good fact checker, you get a reputation score that lets you sit on judging panels. And if you are really, really good on judging panels, there could be other avenues. Maybe, you know, in, you might end up in the scientific side of things as well. There could be, you know, this could come a full-time job for certain people who just like to find, you know, get get to the truth. Um, one of the things when you talk about something this big that can change something so fundamental to culture and society mm. you you run up against well in web3 we talk about the gatekeepers all the time and gatekeepers aren't willing to let their gates down are they so i guess yeah are you have you do you plan to speak to I, I'll, I'll keep it to the newspapers because that's really my my thing i don't know about peer-to-peer -peer review journals mm. or how that works universities i guess but do you do you go into the future hand in hand with the New York Times or are you, do you go into the future like without them? How, how does, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I get asked that a bit. Um, when I built this, I built it with just people in mind. I built it with a protocol replacing those institutions like the New York Times. Um, and I still think that's the end game, but I can also see a future where a newspaper that's struggling um, but wants to exist in order to cut costs, they can cut a huge amount of the support staff and instead just use Olus's review protocols in place of its while still employing journalists and maybe doing revenue share with the journalists on Olus, maybe doing marketing for the journalists. So their, their, um, uh, their pieces will, will have further reach and take a cut for that. So it's a possible we could see a hybrid future where institutions exist in some way, a much more slim down way than they do now. Okay. That's, that's interesting. And, and the data and, and the metrics and reputation scores are going to be so important for that, right? Because if you go to an alley, you can just, you can say, Hey, if it's an outsource kind of play here, look at, look at all of our fact checkers and they've done a million a million reviews and their reviews are 80 percent correct it's like wow okay well maybe we kind of lean into that bridges between old and new uh this yeah. is you julio atino uh the nexus book uh are so important grounding it in something you do today while pulling them into the future right 
Yeah, and I, like I think, as you said, if they look at those review scores and they're they're really good, and they're acutely aware of the fact that trust. This is another thing we haven't spoken about. Trust in media is in free fall. People just don't believe anything that's said anymore, even from the likes of uh, your New York Times of this world. I think they've got a trust score of sub fifty percent, and that's one of your most trustworthy newspapers in the world, right? Um, so if, to improve their business, you'd like to think that. Yeah. They could harness this in, in, in some way. They would like to in, in, harness it. Um, yeah. Kind of link it. We spoke about this before the show about linking these technologies. A few weeks ago, we had Cena. She was from Circle and she was talking about USDC and using USDC in in war zones, in natural disaster areas. And thinking about this, I mean, like a, a part of the thing with Circle was... Um, financial education for parts of the world that don't have access to banks like banking the bank list this is what perhaps one of those things where it works together with that to if you're in one of these places yeah okay you can make some money by writing about it that brings you into the system then and it kind of like you have this flywheel of, of blockchain technology doing good and that's what yes, i was just I thinking no absolutely and also it's part very much part of the anti-censorship part of Olus. So this is the third part. We've got a nice natural segue here that like the first part is fixing the economic issues facing media, which are dire. So it's a new financial economic model. Second one is fix, fixing trust issues. The third one um, is censorship. And a lot, it doesn't affect us or many of us on this podcast, I would hope. But in many parts of the world over the last five years, 85% um, of the world's population to be precise lives in an area where media freedom has been reduced. A lot of governments around the world, as we all know, introduced quite draconian rules around uh, COVID. Um, they got taken, they got, you know, they didn't get renewed in our part of the world, but in other parts of the world, the dictators said, you know what, I kind of like these restrictions, I'll, I'll keep them in place. Um, so a, a huge part of, a huge element of us successfully enabling journalists to resist this censorship is using censorship resistant monies. Now I know USDC isn't fully censorship resistant, but I, sh I would like to think that circle isn't going to censor transactions because some dictator somewhere else in the world is unhappy with what a journalist is writing. So th there's a huge amount of synergies there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just to think about the ability to tell stories in uh, geographic areas of massive conflict, right? where the news is largely has to has to send it through a particular lens due to p political affiliations funding all of that kind of stuff yeah. and where you see social media platforms for people on the ground basically being shut down right that mm. you know hey we don't we don't want to see this stuff right but now it's like there's an opportunity to validate that viewpoint through uh the review process right the fact checkers all of that kind of stuff and this this could be really interesting, man. I mean, it's a long road. It's a big road. Uh, you got to do it in steps, but what a vision, man. Yeah. yeah um, thanks. Um, it, yeah, it's, 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 I don't know. It's as disruptive as it gets, I guess. Um, and you're, you're disrupting an industry that will, you know, is very good at, you know, coming after people <laughs> I'm acutely aware of. Um, you know, they've, they've got the printing press right now um, and the readership. Um, so it'll be a tough battle. I have no doubt about yeah. it um but you know we're ready for it love yeah. it yeah. love it well yeah. speaking of tying these shows together, I, 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 just, I think that again is perhaps our biggest ever disruptor that we've ever had on the on the show <laughs> Def, definitely definitely um well let's let's leave a we, we have a fun show coming up next week with uh with don norman who's kind of the uh kind of the og of uh of designing things and making things for humans to use uh his book design for a better world we'll be talking about uh, um, but, uh, Kieran, what, what question would you love to leave for Don to answer based on his expertise? You know, a little bit about mm -hmm. him, about his non-traditional yeah. path to design. Um, what would you want to ask Don? I wanted to ask him, uh, what, to what extent does he think, uh, misconceptions about people and our society holds back design? Boom. What, what a question. <laughs> I love that. 
Fantastic. Well, Kieran, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, Olas get put together and, and built. And please keep us uh, posted on your story and, and what we could do as right. If you're doing an MVP or a test or something, we'd sure. love to. We're both writers. We'd love That's to, you know, uh, cool. participate with to. that. Yeah, big time. That'd be really cool. Thanks. Uh, Mark, hit us up about the book club, man. Tell, tell them what we're doing. Can I show some more books? So more books. Uh, this this week we're reading The Order of Time about there is no time, essentially. It's about quantum mechanics and time at the quantum level and how essentially it doesn't really exist. Um it's beyond mine and Jeremy's scope, but it's part of our quantum season. So join us every Friday. Um for book club. Very interesting. Yeah. Hey, thinking on paper book club, reading is now a team sport, right? Uh, another thanks to uh, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E dot com. These guys are marketing's on-demand talent platform, flexing out with wonderful vetted resources, over 3,000 of them that they organize, all interdisciplinary, pointing to your project, whether it's a day, a week, a month, a year. They're wonderful. They've been great supporters of the show for a long, long time. And as Mark mentioned, if you resonate with the kind of stuff we're doing as a brand, as a company, we are looking for sponsors for the next season. So please hit us up, thinking on paper.xyz. Be disruptive. Stay curious. Keep thinking on paper. Till next Bye. time.